Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, tutorial. Uh, and thanks again for joining us on a fall Friday. I know it's it's probably really nice out where you are, so thanks for sticking indoors and, and following along with us. Um, so uh, the tutorial today is on gateway de deployment on the Anvil Composable subsystem. Um, my name is Rajesh Kalyanam. I'm a research scientist at Purdue University. I am also the co-PI of the Anvil HPC system. Uh, we've got a couple of Purdue staff here as well. Uh, some of them will be joining a little later. So we've um, got Eric Goff, who's the uh, who's a senior computational scientist or lead computational scientist, I'm sorry, at Purdue University. He's the um, the architect of the composable subsystem and also the PI of our campus cloud uh, subsystem, which is very similar to this. So uh, I'm sure he can answer all the hard questions that come up later on. Uh, we've also got a couple of engineers in here, um, Sam Weekly, who also works on the composable subsystem. He's gonna be helping uh, maybe with some of the more thorny issues if, if there's issues during the, the hands-on portion. Um, so uh, here's a quick uh, sort of, I guess, overview of the, the schedule for today. Uh, I think we are supposed to have an, a 90 minutes of the first session and then a 30 minute break, and then another session of 90 minutes. Uh, it's front loaded with a lot of presentation materials. Um, so I'll try to get through those as quickly as possible. Then we get into hands-on with the application deployment section here. Uh, just before the break, uh, and then we, we kind of play it by ear, see how much we can get done in the first half. And then after the break, we, we kind of ramp up more of the hands-on um, activities. And I'm, I'm hopeful that with the um, experience you get in the first half, you should be able to get through those pretty quickly as well. And then we'll probably have some time for questions and more broader discussions at the end. Um, so since this is an introductory tutorial, uh, the goals are really to, to primarily introduce um, everyone here to just the Angle cluster itself and its various components. Uh, that's, that's not really, uh, I guess, germane to the, the bulk of this tutorial, but just to give you a sense of where the composable subsystem fits in um, in the Angle infrastructure. Um, then some information on just the composable subsystem itself, uh, some preliminary information about containers, Docker, Kubernetes, and other things that um, form the composable subsystem. I'm, I'm sure some of you are already familiar with this, but since this is introductory, we just really quick like walk through, but not really get into any weeds. Uh, but the, the primary goal is to show you how the Anvil composable subsystem really makes uh, application deployment very easy uh, through its web interface so that you don't have to deal with a lot of the, um, the growing pains or the the barriers that Kubernetes and Docker typically provide or, or uh, bring up. Um, and so you, you, I hope you'll experience that through this tutorial and see how easy it is to use. Um, and then we'll get into some examples of, uh, I guess, common microservices or pieces that, that form gateways, obviously not an entire gateway, but just give you a sense of how you can deploy things and maybe use it for your own gateway platform. Um, so some more logistics, uh, as I said before, this is this is an introductory, so you don't need any previous experience with Docker or Kubernetes or cloud or any of that. Uh, since you're all here uh, with Zoom, I'm, I'm hoping you all have access to a browser uh, and we typically prefer Firefox or Chrome, but it should uh, work with other browsers as well. Um, there's a URL for the tutorial exercises. You'll, you'll all receive a, an account and a password to follow along with the hands-on activities. Um, but I'll put this up again as we get to that portion, so you don't have to worry about um, making a note of that. Uh, so this will, these accounts will stay for the duration of this tutorial, and then they're removed after. Uh, but as you'll see, it's pretty easy to get allocations on Anvil, um, and so you should be able to get access um, beyond the gateway tutorial as well if, you, if you're interested in doing more. Um, as we've been chatting before, so we'll try to answer questions to the best of our abilities, uh, our staff and my colleagues here will help monitor chat and answer questions there as they come up. Uh, but you can also just um, interrupt me if you have any questions now, I'll try to answer as well. All right, so um, just a quick overview of what Anvil is. Um, here's the, the entire title of the project. So it's a category one, National Composable Advanced Computational Resource for the Future of Science and Engineering. And Anvil was developed in response to this NSS solicitation for advanced computing systems. Uh, this was in 2019. Um, and the goal of the solicitation from NSF was to uh, request proposals for organizations or institutions that can serve as service providers by hosting 
uh, the high performance computing systems and also other innovative uh, systems as well. So Anvil was funded under this um, solicitation and grant. It is uh, split essentially into two pieces. The, the first part of the grant is just for the system acquisition and the deployment itself. So that's um, 10 million uh, system acquisition portion, uh, which was completed uh, over 2020 and 20, well, over 2021. Um, and system was deployed and then ran through NSF's acceptance criteria and review. Uh, and it's been in production since February 1 of this year. So in production, and will we'll run for five years of operations and we have an operational budget uh, and support for each of those five years as well. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, the Exceed program and its follow-on access program, but uh, really quick, it's uh, essentially an umbrella program that's intended to help manage these NSF funded systems, uh, manage allocations, support, and various other coordination activities for these systems. Uh, and so being an NSF resource or NSF funded resource, Anvil um, is free to use for researchers in the US, uh, but you need to go through the allocation process, uh, which is managed by the NSF um, access program. And I have links towards the end of the presentation on, on how you can get on that. And this uh, composable subsystem that we have is also allocated as part of um, this allocation process. Um, so here's a high level overview of the different components of the system. Uh, at its core, Anvil is still a high performance computing system that's a capacity resource. So we have a thousand compute nodes. Each of these have 128 core, uh, the third generation AMD Epic processors, uh, the peak performance is 5.1 petaflops. Um, and, and complementing that HPC systems, these are the CPU nodes. Complementing that is a set of GPU nodes, which uh, each have four A100 GPUs. And there are also a couple of large memory nodes that have one terabyte of RAM each for the more memory intensive tasks. Um, the, the portion we'll be focusing on today is primarily the, compute, the composable subsystem. Uh, so this uh, has eight large memory and storage nodes, which all form part of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and we use Rancher to simplify um, deploying containers onto this um, composable subsystem. And uh, we'll see a lot of this um, as I go through the presentation and also through your hands-on activities today. Um, and then behind all of this, there's a multi-tier storage, uh, which has different kinds of storage, uh, including object store. Um, there's a parallel file system, and then uh, other much faster file systems as well. And if you're familiar with Globus, you can actually use um, and Globus to transfer files from Anvil to other systems uh, that you may be using in your own research or, or projects. All right, so now to the more, I guess, interesting portion of this. So, um, Again, uh, the composable subsystem is just one portion of this, but uh, particularly for gateway workloads, this is probably the most interesting one among these and the focus of our, our tutorial today. So um, I'm sure I don't have to uh, talk about this in this audience, but um, there's really a need for these composable platforms as we are noticing. So um, gone are the days when people really just needed HPC resources where they could run their simulations. Uh, now you need a much more diverse computing resource pool. So you need um, things like, uh, which have the flexibility of, of commercial cloud, where you can deploy different applications. You might want to deploy containerized applications um, that run and host persistent services uh, that others may be using. Uh, you might want to have the base science gateways and applications, which is uh, really central to, to this conference and this community. Um, and so there's a need beyond these uh, HPC systems uh, for resources that can support these uh, more diverse workloads. And uh, there's, there's a few um, campus resources and NSF funded resources like Jetstream and Jetstream 2, which have been uh, supporting both, both bare metal virtual machines and other um, higher level uh, application stacks for some of this, but um, this composable subsystem that we have is really intended to uh, reduce further barriers and make it a lot easier to, to host these kinds of diverse workloads. Uh, a big portion of this is to also give uh, researchers direct access to this composable platform. Uh, so then that again reduces the barriers and the issues they may have uh, with long turnaround times and having to deal with um, the support staff um, as well. And so then they can use both the resource and uh, the DevOps methodologies that the platform is really supporting to uh, make their science both portable and reproducible, but then also help reduce their time to analysis through 
uh, these web-based gateways and um, tools that you can deploy on this platform. So um, this is a term that um, Eric has actually coined for PsyOps. Uh, so, so there's really this, uh, this transition from um, the, the, the previous state of the art, which I just mentioned, uh, where you have either the researchers or the developers here in their own silo, and then you have the operations of the, the system engineers in their other silo. Um, and then you have this barrier between them where they have to communicate across this. Um, so for things like provisioning virtual machines, getting code deployed, or maybe upgrading their code, um, there's a huge barrier uh, and turnaround time when they have to um, communicate across this, this barrier essentially uh, to get that done. So uh, by combining both DevOps and this composable infrastructure, we, we try to solve some of these challenges. So the, the composable infrastructure itself uh, provides you with these customizable on-demand compute resources. So you no longer have to request a, a specific virtual machine to be uh, brought up or hosted for you. Uh, and you can get a varying amount of resources depending on the needs of your application. Uh, but then on the DevOps side, um, you can now deploy these applications using these principles of uh, having infrastructure as code. So you have a well-defined uh, specification of the infrastructure you're hosting. Um, there's automation which you can use to quickly push new changes as you make them to your applications, uh, but also portability and reproducibility. So it's it's easier to um, host these applications and then get your science done with, with fewer barriers. Uh, so what does this look like in practice with the researcher in the loop? So um, this is essentially the, the PsyOps uh, cycle. So you have images that you build or container images that you build using Docker. Uh, which contain both your software, your environment, and maybe other um, data files from your specific application. You upload them to this registry, which hosts all these container images. Uh, you can have various um, access controls enabled on them, version control, and a bunch of other things, uh, which really help you uh, maintain a record of, uh, of the different configurations and everything that's, that's related to your image. Um, the orchestration infrastructure, Kubernetes and Rancher, which we will see here shortly, um, helps you pull these images from these registries and then deploy them um, in the way you want, at the scale you want. Um, and um, then once those are running, other people can access them directly uh, through the public um, interface. And along with that, you also get feedback and monitoring for free. So you can actually monitor these deployed resources, see how they're performing. Say you have more demand for some of these resources or these um, services, then uh, the researchers can either maybe make some changes to their code or just scale up the, um, the deployment and then um, help support that need. And then you have the cycle where if they're um, making any changes, then they can do that again, push the image, and then it goes back all the way around. Uh, but with all the, the DevOps principles in play here, uh, this becomes a lot more efficient because um, you can just make your updates, push the new image, get it deployed again pretty quickly without having to go through a long cycle or, or a ticketing system to, to get the the IT staff to do that for you. Um, a few uh, things on terminology. Uh, of course, I won't go into the weeds here just because this is uh, intended as an introductory tutorial. So uh, we don't really need to get into uh, the specifics of Docker and a few other things. The, 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 primary, the primary goal is to um, show you how easy it is to, to deploy these applications without having to know as much uh, about the internals unless um, you really need to. Uh, do some advanced um, monitoring or uh, optimizations of your deployment. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Docker. It's, it's a containerization technology. Um, it helps you essentially do more portable deployments, reproducible deployments. It's cross-platform, so you can build your applications, host them on different clouds, um, and uh, it's easier. Uh, just because of the wide community you have, there's a wide scale adoption, and it also helps improve your velocity because you can quickly uh, build these or make changes to your code and then push them forward. Um, Kubernetes uh, then sort of builds on top of that. It's an open source container orchestration system. So once you have these Docker containers and other container technologies, uh, Kubernetes can help you really orchestrate them so that you can scale them automatically as you need, depending on the, the load. Um, it helps with failovers where if the container fails or a certain node fails, then the workload is automatically moved over to a different node. Uh, you get other things like monitoring and alerting as well. Um, you can set up these Kubernetes clusters in different environments. 
Uh, in addition to the container orchestration, it also helps give you uh, different storage interfaces that you can use depending on the kind of application you have. Um, there's also uh, more enhanced security policies, particularly in the, in the realm of networking. So um, you can have both software-defined networking and other security policies that you can employ to really clamp down, clamp down on, the, on the security of your applications that are running. And just like Docker, again, it's velocity focused. Um, it's easy to define these Kubernetes resources in a standard YAML syntax that you can use to, uh, to specify the deployments you want, uh, this continuous integration and deployment as well. So as you make changes, um, you can um, deploy these resources with auto scaling and a lot of other uh, things that, that come with, uh, with the continuous integration and deployment support. And then one level higher than that is Rancher, which again reduces some of the barriers with Kubernetes. For those of you who are familiar with Kubernetes, you know it's uh, it's pretty hard sometimes to to create these YAML files for your deployments, deal with the uh, with essentially bringing up the Kubernetes cluster, uh, managing it yourself, and then um, deploying these resources into Kubernetes or orchestrating these different related resources. Uh, Rancher essentially helps simplify some of that and gives you a web, a nice web interface to manage a lot of these things. So um, at the deployment level, it helps you manage uh, multiple clusters, multiple Kubernetes clusters and locations you can bring in existing Kubernetes clusters and manage them through that. Um, it also helps with the different Kubernetes management tasks itself, such as provisioning clusters, managing the catalog of applications and projects and, and all of that. Um, the interface itself is very easy to use, as you'll see shortly. Uh, it's, a, it's a web interface, um, and you don't have to deal with some of the, the complications with Kubernetes. And uh, usually when you're new to Kubernetes, it's, um, it's a pretty high barrier to entry, even if you're familiar with creating containers, because there's, there's just so much in the YAML uh, resource specification syntax that you need to deal with. So um, the Rancher web interface really helps simplify a lot of that, and you can uh, usually deploy some applications with just the click of a few buttons and, and get going with that. Um, the other big uh, advantage of Rancher is there's a lot of uh, role-based access control and authorization built in uh, beyond what you might even have with Kubernetes. So you can do things like projects um, in Rancher, which help manage all the resources for that particular project. Uh, so especially if you're someone who works in a research computing department and you want to manage these cloud resources, uh, for the, say different projects or different allocations, um, then the Rancher projects really come in handy at that point because you can manage uh, both these groups of research, these uh, groups of um, researchers who are you or engineers who are using the Kubernetes cluster, separate them out, um, have project level um, resource specifications and resource limits, uh, and so you can really manage uh, really large multi-project. Uh, deployments through Rancher much better than you might with just the uh, Kubernetes infrastructure. Um, we looked at container registries previously in that uh, PsyOps diagram. So it's essentially a repository where you store your different container images. Um, and uh, obviously, I won't go through the list here, but you can, um, there's a few different registry examples that you can use. Um, Anvil uses Harbor as its container registry. Um, and some of these registries also bring in features such as uh, vulnerability audits and scanning of container images so that you can look for issues in the, the images that are being deployed in your environment as well. Uh, so in practice, what can you do with the composable subsystems such as this? Uh, I'm sure again, uh, this, um, this audience doesn't need an introduction to this, but you can probably imagine and maybe you're already using containers in your different gateway deployments. And this just makes it easy to, to manage these and also maybe orchestrate them um, in a much more seamless fashion than, than what you've, uh, you're used to in, in the past. Um, and obviously a bunch of different technologies here. Um, so some of these already have recipes from Kubernetes or um, other sources such as Helm, which, uh, which we'll talk about a little later. Uh, and so you can typically get up and running maybe with like a RabbitMQ deployment uh, in some sort of high availability fashion pretty quickly with just a few button clicks. Um, and that's the same for other messaging platforms like Kafka and others. Uh, there's screenshots here of um, some Jupyter-based gateways that our engineers have built in the past. 
Um, so uh, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, movement towards building uh, gateways based on Jupyter, just because of how easy it is to, to create these gateways and also the, the low barrier to entry. Uh, so you can take a Jupyter notebook, either convert it into app mode or use things like Project Voila, which allows you to um, essentially turn a Jupyter notebook into a gateway environment with just the interactive features and none of the code cells. And so uh, say you had a Jupyter-based gateway like this, then it, it's pretty straightforward to get that up and running. And this just shows some examples of that. And a few other things you might be able to uh, deploy again, not just gateways, but the, the rest of the microservices that your gateway may depend on. For example, if you have a data processing pipeline like a message queue, uh, or you had an API interface to a database or something like that, then uh, it's pretty easy to deploy those as well. Um, I won't go into this terminology. I'll just leave it here. And then as we um, get some more into the hands-on portion, we can, we can review some of this again. Uh, but these are some of the, the terminology that we will be using today. Uh, container, most of you may be familiar with. There's a few other concepts specific to Kubernetes that, that build on top of that. Uh, but as we work through the, the hands-on exercises, we'll see examples of each of these resources, um, and then we can discuss more about them at that time as well. So with that, uh, I think we'll start with our first hands-on portion of today. Um, so um, there are usernames and passwords created for each of you. I'll, I'll show that real quick. Uh, the URL to the composable interface is here. I'll put it in the Zoom chat as well. Um, so our first step is to just get ourselves familiarized with the, um, with the interface itself. So I can exit out of the screen. All right. Just gonna put this link in here. Chat. All right. So the tiny URL there has is the um, as the link to these instructions here. There's a Google Doc that I hope all of you can access. Um, it goes through the step-by-step -step instructions for everything we are going to be seeing now. Uh, there's a few sections in here, so I would say uh, you might be interested. You can jump ahead and read through, but it might be good to wait until we get there. Uh, just because you can see what I'm doing on the screen and just follow along. Uh, some of the Rancher UI is a little hard to um, get around just because of the, the font and color choices. So it might be useful just to see what it looks like. Uh, but as, as part of this first session, uh, what we will be doing is just having you log in to Rancher uh, at this URL here. This URL is also in the, the instructions here in section 1.1. There's usernames and passwords assigned to each of you. So in here, you'll see in step three, uh, there's a spreadsheet. If you go in there, you can find the username and password uh, for each of you in there. And if you can't find one for your name, then let me know and I'll uh, look into that. Uh, so let me try logging in as well. And the first step is just to, I guess, get yourself familiarized with what the interface looks like. No, I guess I did that a little too quickly. Uh, let me go back. So, so once you get into composable.anvil.rcse.purdue.edu, then click on use a local user, not the big button here, but the link below. Uh, and there you can enter your username and password and just log in with the local user. Uh, once you log in, you, you some of you may be presented with a window that just tells you what's new in this version. You can just click out of that. Um, and then you should be dropped into the screen here. And I'll wait for a bit until um, everyone's able to log in. And if you're having issues logging in, uh, then please drop that in the chat and we can take a look. I'll just give everyone a couple of minutes to log in. All right. Um, so as you see here, the so once you've logged in, um, the first step is to look at your namespace and project. So, oh, there's something in the chat. 
So Steve, in the Google Doc, uh, in step three here, there's a link to a spreadsheet. If you click on that, you should be able to find the, the usernames and passwords. I can put the link to the Google Doc in the chat as well. Thanks, Mark. And you should be able to find the entry under your name. Um, and then just use that. All right. Um, so these are concepts in um, both Rancher and Kubernetes. So Rancher has the concept of projects as we talked about before. So if you mouse over this link here that says global, you will see the cluster first. And as we, as I briefly mentioned before, Rancher actually allows you to manage different Kubernetes clusters. In this case, there's just one. But say you had uh, a dev cluster and a production cluster, then you might see multiple entries in here. And under the cluster, there is a project that's been created for uh, a set of users. In this case, each of you has your own project. Uh, but say you had an allocation uh, with multiple users who are part of that allocation, then they would all be on this uh, project itself. So there, there could be multiple projects based on the different allocations that you have. So uh, so mouse over that and then click um, the cluster or mouse over that, go to the animal and then click the, the project. And then that brings you to this other screen, uh, which has workloads, load balancing, and a couple of other things that you can deploy. Um, so I'll wait until everyone can get there. And then we just look around here for a minute. And the first step we are going to be doing is looking at your namespace, both on the web UI and also um, in the command line as well, which I will just show you how to get to that. So, uh, so under the concept of projects, there's the notion of namespaces. And namespaces are really one way that Kubernetes allows you to essentially separate out your deployments from others. So, so things can be restricted to namespaces so that only you have access to those resources um, and you can um, essentially, that, that's one way of controlling access to the things you're deploying. And usually namespaces themselves have limits on the amount of resources that you can um, use. And so that's one way again of restricting the amount of uh, Kubernetes resources and containers that, that users can um, essentially launch um, here. So, so if you click on, or if you mouse over global and then go down to your project and click on that, you should be able to see this screen here with workloads, load balancing and all of this. If you click on namespaces here at the top, the band here at the top, uh, you should see a namespace in this project, which is the namespace that's been pre-created for you. And if any of you cannot see a namespace here, when you click on this, then please let us know. We, we've made sure that you should be able to see it, but if not, let us know and we will try to fix that because it, you cannot really proceed any further until the namespace is in place. Uh, so that's one way to review your namespace, but then uh, Kubernetes also has a kube control um, utility, which allows you to do things from the command line. So it's a binary that um, can be used to access your cluster remotely. So, so here we are accessing the Kubernetes cluster through uh, the web page, but then say you wanted to deploy these sources the old fashioned way, um, and you wanted to be able to deploy these sources to this from your own local machine or local laptop, and you did not want to have to do this um, through the web interface. And the other reason for this could also be that you are more comfortable in the command line interface, or you already have prior experience with Kubernetes and its features. And um, there are some features which are a little hard to get through um, on this web interface. So you may prefer wanting to use the, the command line kube control command, which is a lot more powerful than what you can do through here. Um, so in, in that case, um, you can also do that either there's two different ways of getting a kube control. So one, one way is what I'll show here. So as you mouse over here at the top, just click on the cluster and don't go to the project. So uh, mouse over here come down here, click on the cluster. This gives you a whole other new page. Um, so I know these are a little confusing, but, but that's the way Rancher is designed. So, so if you see this dashboard page, there's a few buttons in here at the top right. Uh, one of these is the kube config file. So this is how you would configure remote access to the Kubernetes cluster. So 
if you're familiar with OpenStack, um, there's an OpenRC file typically. So in this case, the kubeconfig file is something that you can download and then um, save to a different machine from where you need command line access to this cluster. And as long as you have the kube control binaries installed there, you can remotely manage your deployments through that. So that's one way uh, to get access from your local machine. Um, let's see, because Mona has a screenshot. Uh, I think that's, so Mona, I see that uh, it just says graph information not available. I think that's okay. That's not really, and uh, that should be fine. Yeah, uh, but if you run into other issues, we can help debug. Um, so yeah, so the kube config file can be used to access a cluster remotely, but you can also do launch kube control here, click on that button that drops you into the shell where you can run these commands. So we saw the namespace through the web interface. Now we can inspect it through this command as well. And you will see that in this document as well. So you can also type that. So. So you can do two different things. You can do kube control get namespace that, and your namespace is has the same name as your username. So if you were say tutorial 07, your namespace should be tutorial 07. Um, so one command that you can run is just kube control get namespace tutorial 07. So this, this follows typical Kubernetes syntax where you would say kube control get uh, the kind of resource it is. In this case, it's a namespace and the name of the resource, uh, which is tutorial 01 in my case, but you might have your own. That just gives you very basic information about the namespace itself. All we're looking to see is that it's active. If you just did kube control get namespace, which typically gets you all the objects um, in the default namespace, then you would get an error. And this is because uh, the role-based access control is really tight here. So uh, the tutorial users don't really have the level of access that a regular user may have. And so this is uh, forbidden in this case. And so all the operations that you do here have to be specific to the namespace. Uh, so yeah, so Steve, you can actually, thanks for that. Uh, if you have uh, issues seeing on your own screen, you can actually increase the size, but I can also do, Think that. Let's see. Kind of increase the size, which I cannot seem to be able to do. I think it doesn't note in here. Uh, the size. Mm -hmm. hmm. Let's read it. Thought we had a note in here on increasing the size of the screen. Oh. There is control shift and plus. Yeah, somehow that's not working for me. I don't know if it's because it might be command shift if you're you're on a Mac. Oh, there you go. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Ooh, that's I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. That's that's a little too large. But okay. So yeah, hopefully you can all see that. And I guess you can do the same on your screens as well if, if it's hard to see. Uh, thanks, Steve, for pointing that out. So yes, um, you can do kube control get namespace, and NS is just shorthand for namespace. I could have also type namespace uh, and get the same thing. So get is just really basic information, but if you did want to get more detailed information about it, you can do describe. Um, and that gives you a lot more detailed information on the namespace. So. Uh, in particular, so kube control describe ns and then the name of your namespace. Uh, that's the command run, and that's also described in the, in the document. So you can see here down below, um, you can see the quotas that you have assigned for your particular namespace, uh, the limits on the number of CPU cores, the memory, um, and storage, and other information on the, the container level, um, default limits and re the requests. Um, so you can get more information about your objects typically by using kube control describe. Uh, if you were, if you had a container or what's called a pod in the Kubernetes world, which is essentially a set of one or more containers, then um, if you did kube control describe pod in the name of your pod, it would give you um, 
a lot of different information, like maybe the status, the um, the environment. Uh, yes, I'll answer that question in a minute. Uh, uh, so it gives you information about your uh, the image that was used for your container, um, the environment variables maybe that have been set, and below here typically for pods, it also gives you the status of the pod when when it was launched. Are there any errors? And so on about that. And to answer Wilson's question, yes, your quotas can be extended. Uh, in this particular case, since this is a tutorial, we have some uh, hard limits here. Uh, but in general, namespace quotas can be um, changed by the admin at any point. All right, so I will wait there to see if everyone has been able to run these commands and access the, the kube control shell. And if you haven't, then let us know. Okay, the link to the instructions. I mean, post that. The link to the instructions. Uh, Mona said your shell seems hung. Yes, yeah, sometimes it uh, may take a bit of time to, to come back. You might just close it or close out of it and then um, go back and hit cube control again. Okay, and while everyone's trying that, I'll just show you around uh, some more. So as you see in this screen, I mean, I know it doesn't work for some of you, uh, but you can see uh, more information about the, um, this is just a dashboard on the on the cluster itself, um, on the pods, the limits in the pods that, that you can deploy here, a few other things. Uh, you can also look at, Click there, the different clusters. If you get into the cluster itself, you can see that. Projects and namespaces. And then there's a few other context sensitive menus in here on other tools that you can set up. Um, the projects and namespaces that you have access to. Uh, the different nodes in the cluster. So, for example, you can see here status um, on the eight different um, nodes that, that we have, or eight different. Yeah, the different nodes that make up the Kubernetes cluster uh, on Anvil. Um, you can see the, the different number of cores that are used, the RAM, and so on. More information on the cluster itself. All right, so we will move on. Uh, and the next step is a lot more exciting. So uh, you've just seen how Rancher can be used to um, essentially do a few things from your web browser, uh, manage your namespace, maybe create, and we, we haven't really had you create a new namespace, but those are things you can do from the cube control shell or even just from the, the web UI itself. Uh, but but really the, the most important thing is being able to deploy applications um, here. And that, that's the, the second part that we'll be working on uh, right until the break. Uh, and as you get more familiarized with the web interface, then the second half will uh, essentially have uh, sparser instructions, uh, but we then, after the break, look into uh, in, in interacting with these applications from other applications, and also an example of a simple um, Jupyter-based gateway. So that's just um, sort of the lay of the land of what's to come. So uh, we looked at namespaces, but then as you're deploying applications, there's a few key terminologies uh, that we need to be aware of. Uh, we touched on some of this before. so. A workload is what Kubernetes typically calls an application um, that's running on there. Um, these workloads can run in one or more pods. Uh, so a workload essentially can consist of uh, one or more pods that have been started all together as part of that workload. A pod itself is a group of one or more containers. And the reason you might want to do this is maybe you have one that's your actual application container, another one that's a monitoring container that runs alongside it. Uh, and you might typically want to have a pod and a group of containers if they need to share resources um, and they're not really doing uh, diverse things. So for example, if you had a web server and a, a database, then you, you would have a separate pod for each of them. 
But if you had a database and maybe another one that's monitoring the database or or helping ingest data into the database, then you might put them in the same pod essentially. Um, so you have a workload. A workload is one or more pods. A pod again is a group of one or more containers, and containers themselves are created from basic Docker images. And um, there's a few different workloads that you can essentially deploy on Kubernetes. Uh, deployment is the the most um, obvious one, where it's just a deployment of one or more pods. A daemon set is something. Uh, that deploys on all the Kubernetes nodes that you have in your cluster. That might be something that you do just for, say, monitoring um, your cluster or, or applications similar to that that need to run on all the nodes. Uh, stateful set. So typically, your pods um, don't really maintain state unless you do it yourself through the the code or the application itself. Um, and one reason for this is because uh, pods can be terminated at any time. Um, they may be moved to a different node in the cluster, and so you can't really assume that they are running on a particular node. Uh, now, there's ways to do that to, to essentially have it run on a particular node, and you can um, do selection criteria and tags and annotations um, essentially to make sure they run on a specific node. But, but in general, uh, pods can run on any node in your cluster. Typically, they don't have state unless you've implemented that yourself. But then if you uh, do a stateful set in your workload, then that, that essentially tracks state as well. A job is something um, that is more familiar to the, to the batch realm. So you would uh, typically just run the pod and then exit. So maybe that's something that's triggered as part of um, the periodic processing that you want to do. And then you just run some processing in a containerized application and then exit. And to help schedule those, you can have uh, cron jobs that essentially launch uh, pods on a per, on a particular schedule and then exit. Um, and by default, Crancher um, uses deployments um, as its uh, workload implementation. So, so most where any workload that you would typically deploy is uh, is essentially just a deployment. And we will do that really quick now as part of our next hands-on activity. Um, quick note on the storage. Um, so. Uh, pods and containers typically are ephemeral. We, we talked about that. They can be, um, they can die at any point and then come back up, uh, and then you don't really maintain any state or data. So, um, if your application needs to retain the data that um, for the pod, uh, then you need to essentially provide some sort of persistent storage, and uh, that's where the persistent uh, storage comes in in Kubernetes. Uh, so, so pods can be configured to mount. This persistent storage at some location in the containers file system. Um, there's a few concepts related to storage. So you have um, the storage class, which is the type of storage you're using to back your persistent storage. Uh, the persistent volume is essentially a piece of the storage class. So say if you have an NFS server that's, that's serving your storage, then it's um, it's essentially a folder on your NFS server. Um, and the volume claim is something that the pod requests on behalf of the user for storage. And we have a diagram here that shows you that process. So, so you have a pod that's essentially a Docker container. Um, and there is a volume created for the storage that you want your pod to have. Um, it in turn creates a persistent volume claim for the storage it needs. Um, then the storage class uh, that's been defined for the volume claim that um, essentially creates the persistent volume um, in the actual cluster resource or storage resource um, based on the type of storage class that you want. So, um, so the pod essentially creates the claim. Uh, the claim results in the storage class uh, furnishing a persistent volume from its implementation for it. And then um, the persistent volume is then bound to the claim. Um, and then made available to your um, to your uh, container essentially, and a lot of this complexity is masked by the Rancher UI. Uh, so we'll just see now really quick, so uh, pretty soon, um, how when you're creating a deployment or a workload, uh, you can actually just click through, have it um, fill in a bunch of options, and then have it do all of this automatically for you. Set up the persistent volume claim um, and the persistent volume, and then attach it to your to your pod essentially. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, I don't know if that's coming up here. Well, not really. Okay. Uh, so a quick note on persistent volumes. So there's a lot of other options with persistent volumes on how many nodes 
It can be mounted onto, do you support both read and write um, or just read? Uh, do you support multiple read writes and a lot of um, other options? And so you can really customize uh, the persistent volumes depending on the, the kind of application you have uh, and what the needs are for that particular application. So uh, this next part of the hands-on activity is uh, to deploy a database. Uh, and in this case, it's a Postgres database that has some GIS data. And um, so Mona is asking, can Globus be available from the persistent storage? Um, so I'm going to try to answer that and then I'll have our uh, engineers pitch in as well. So, so it depends on the, um, on, on the storage class that's being used for your persistent storage. Uh, so say you were just using NFS as your provisioner uh, so you had an NFS server that's serving your uh, your data, then you would have to essentially install a Globus endpoint on the server, uh, identify the actual uh, file system location where the, the data is being served out of, and then you can access it. Um, so that's that's sort of a roundabout way of getting at the data in the persistent storage. Um, so yes, uh, I guess the short answer is yes, but there's really no, um, I guess, integration in that sense of, of Globus. And of course, there's other storage types as well, uh, such as uh, object store, which um, I guess make it a little more complicated. <coughs> All right. So uh, so let's go back to the hands-on again. Um, there's the URL, I'll put it in the chat again, if you're just joining us. And we are going to section two of this, if I can get around that. All right, so part two of this deployment. So, so now what we are gonna be doing is uh, deploying a workload, which is essentially a Postgres database. Uh, it's gonna be using uh, persistent storage and we'll see how to provision that volume through the Rancher UI um, and then interact with it to, um, to essentially inspect the data and then do a bunch of operations on the database to, to essentially populate the database. So going back to um, this UI again. So as before, uh, mouse over that, go in here and click on your project, which brings you to this screen here where you have uh, workloads, load balancing service and so on. Uh, what we'll be doing here is deploying a new workload. So click on deploy here in the right on the workload screen. So as long as workloads is highlighted, click on deploy. <coughs> That brings you to the screen here uh, where you will be filling a bunch of different options. So all of this is here in this document. So I would suggest uh, read through it carefully and make sure you were following the instructions. But if you have issues or run into any errors, then we can always help you. Uh, so when deploying a workload, you need to select a unique name for it. Let's just say roads in my case, because this is a, a GIS database that has information on the road networks in Michigan. Um, in this case, uh, it's just a single container that's being deployed as part of this workload. Uh, we'll look at more complicated applications a little later, uh, but for now, it's just a single, a simple single application, which has just one container, which is a Postgres database. Um, so the registry that Anvil has essentially holds um, all of these different container images. And so we are going to be using the identifier for the PostGIS container image that we have in there. So you can just copy that, put it in here uh, for your Docker image name. Um, you want to deploy it into your namespace. This should be automatically filled in for you. If it is not, then please let us know. Uh, but as long as you have a namespace and you've verified it before, it should be filled in automatically for you. Um, the next step is to add an environment variable for the, the database password. And we will be using uh, this database a little later or actually connecting to it from a Jupyter Hub deployment. So uh, we need to be able to connect to the database and do operations on it. So for that, we are gonna be adding a password for, for Postgres. So um, that's what we are doing right now. So we are adding an environment variable. So we'll expand this environment variable drop down, click on add variable that gives you a field value pair. Uh, 
Uh, the name of the variable is Postgres underscore password, all caps. And then you can give it whatever value you want, but make sure to, to remember what you've said so that uh, when you're connecting to it later, you'll have to fill that in. So to make, to make a note of the value you're using. Um, just using DB pass in my case. Um, the next step is to, okay, let me just make a note of this as well. So, so in this case, uh, as you see, uh, we are using an environment variable to, to set the password. This is obviously not very secure. Um, anyone else who um, essentially can shell into your container can look at it. Uh, Kubernetes has the notion of secrets that you can use uh, to store uh, things that need to be secure. And there's different ways that you can use a secret in a deployment. So once you've created a Kubernetes secret uh, with, uh, with uh, name value pairs, you can mount that as a volume, as a read-only volume into your container so that it's available maybe in like some dot config directory in your container, um, or you can turn those into environment variables as well through your container. So, so once you have a Kubernetes secret, uh, there's different ways that you can inject that into your container, and that's the more secure way of doing this. But for now, we just uh, do an environment variable here. So, so we've uh, created a name, an M, uh, uh, the put in the right Docker image identifier there, selected the right namespace, um, added an environment variable for the password. Now we'll add a volume for the persistent storage for the database. So um, expand this volume section down here, click on add volume. It gives you a list of the different kinds of volumes you can add. Uh, in this case, we are going to be adding a new persistent volume. If you had pre-created a volume before, you could use that. And as you can see here, um, as I mentioned before, you can use secrets as volumes as well. So the, there's different options here. Uh, but in our case, we'll choose the second one, which is add a new persistent volume. You come to the screen here, which should have popped up. Um, and then we are entering details about the volume claim. So this is a volume claim that's going to be created. Uh, and then it's going to in turn, turn into an actual persistent volume, which is mounted into your container. Uh, so add a name for that. So you can just choose whatever name you want. We don't really need to remember this. So feel free to choose whatever you need. I'm just gonna choose that name. Um, and here we use the storage class to provision a new persistent volume because we haven't created one yet. But if you had one, you could choose this option. Um, here, there's the different storage classes that are available on Anvil. We'll just use the default class, which is the block storage. Uh, and then the size of the persistent volume that you need. So here we choose two uh, because it doesn't really need a whole lot of space. Um, the instructions also ask you to confirm this stuff down here, which I talked about before. Uh, so these are the access modes for this volume. Do you want it to just be read write from one of the nodes or do you want it to be read write on multiple nodes? Uh, and that's typically needed if your pod is something that's going to be running across multiple nodes, but in our case, single node is fine. Uh, so make sure you filled out all of these and this screenshot is also there in the instructions so you can take a look at that and then click define, but we are not done yet. So uh, as you do that, it's gonna now populate this or expand this. And then you also have to specify where the volume is mounted into your container. So the mount point is the path in your container where the volume is going to be mounted. So we will put the path, the default path to Postgres is data folder, <coughs> which is var lib Postgres SQL data. And then we will also put in a subpath in the volume. So um, just really simply, if you say had a persistent volume that was uh, backing different parts of your application, then you could have different folders in your volume that uh, serve different parts of your application. So there may be a data folder, there may be a config folder that's mounted somewhere else. And that's the reason we typically use a subpath so that um, that's the folder under the persistent volume where this uh, data is stored essentially. Uh, and then there's one other step before we can get this running. So we also need to make sure we have resource limits set on, um, on our workload. So go down here, uh, there's this really small link here that says show advanced options. So click on that, that gives you a bunch of other options. Uh, go to the last one here, security and host config. 
Um, scroll all the way down. There's a lot of other options in there. You can see you can either do privileged or not privileged. But down here in the memory and CPU reservation location, so this this section here. <clears throat> and we are going to be adding limits to the workload. So we want to make sure it fits in our uh, namespace limits, but then we also want to make sure we have really specific limits set um, so that it doesn't run away from us. Um, and so in here, um, click on this uh, video button here that says limit two, and then we want to fill in the limits for both the memory and the CPU. So 2000 maybe bytes and 2000 milli CPUs. Uh, once you've done all of that, then you can click launch here at the bottom and then we'll wait for it to um, be up and running. <coughs> Right. I hope everyone was able to follow along with that, but if you um, have any questions or any doubts, you can always look at the instructions here. It's very detailed, so you should be able to follow along there as well. And uh, this is a common, oh, it disappeared before I could say anything about that, but if it says waiting for minimum availability or does not have, that's just uh, Kubernetes trying to schedule it based on the resource limits and everything else you've specified. But once it's up and running, you'll see it says active. And we agree. <coughs> uh, private container port is required. So Mona, I'm not sure if you. You know, I think I made the mistake of clicking on the add port okay. and it, okay. so do I just do a subtract? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, you should just be able to do a subtract and yeah. Ah, okay, that went, thank you. Got it. Yeah, and you, and you can even click on that and then, yeah, even you change it from here if it needs to, but yeah. And if you click into any of that, you can obviously go back there. Um, so you can see this one is up and running, it's in green, uh, not really a whole lot there, but if you click on that link, it takes you to the actual uh, part that's running in the workflow. So you can see there's the, there's the workload itself, um, and then there's just one part in here, which is the container that's running. Uh, there's a few different things you can see here. You will have the logging of the different events in the deployment. Uh, and we'll look into this real quick. So from here, there's this, these three dots in here that you can use um, to look at different things related to this part, like get a shell in there, look at the logs and all of that. Uh, but we will just go directly from the workload to the shell, but I'll give everyone a few minutes to get to the stage. And then just before the break, the last thing we are gonna be doing is populating the, the Postgres database by getting a shell um, or essentially, um, yes, getting a shell linked to this, um, this pod, uh, which drops us into the, the container or the pod itself. And then we can run a few commands in there to, to populate the database. Okay, um, let me run through this step real quick uh, of actually populating the database and interacting with your, uh, with your deployment. So, so typically your end user would not really do this. Uh, this is something uh, that the gateway developer or the, um, the, uh, the DevOps engineer is doing. Uh, so say you have a database that's created, obviously you don't want to, um, put all of the data into the container itself. And so you might have to then uh, deploy the Postgres database and then populate it. So in this particular case, um, you have this workload screen. I hope everyone has it in green and active. Uh, there's these three dots here next to the scale uh, bar. You click on that, uh, go all the way down and click execute shell. Uh, this works because there's just one part in this workload, but if you say had multiple pods, You'd have to click through and then get to the actual pod screen and then uh, do the same thing there. But once you 
do that, you'll see you are dropped in uh, to a shell. This is actually a bash shell, so this is different from the cube control shell you saw before. Uh, but as you can see, the, the user in the container is root. So you're dropped in as the root user. Um, this is your host name for that part. Uh, and what we are going to be doing is essentially running through a few steps to create a database here uh, and then populate it through a SQL file uh, that's already in the container itself. So this obviously this is a contrived example, but uh, we'll be working through this, um, creating the database, populating it with the data in the SQL file, um, just reviewing that everything is fine and then exiting all of that. And then after the break, we'll see how to actually connect to this database and um, do things with the data that's in there. Uh, so there's a few steps in here and you can just copy that and run through them. So that's what we'll be doing here. So first step is to create the database. Um, verify that you actually have the SQL file in there. And that's local <coughs> to your uh, container. And one thing to note is this is uh, slash data. It's not the, the data folder for your Postgres uh, database, which was under Wartlib. So this is just a static path inside the container where we've preloaded the, the SQL file. Um, then you essentially just run the Postgres command to do a bunch of SQL operations um, and then populate it. And hopefully that runs through fine without any errors. Uh, then we'll just review really quick to see that the database and the tables we created actually exist. So, um, it's weird, it's just really slow, right? So PSQL, I'm just getting dropped into the database and I can do a DD. Uh, so DT is just uh, Postgres shorthand to list the tables um, with that name. So we have a wildcard uh, and this actually just shows you um, the, the contents of the database and things we actually dropped in there uh, when we ran the, the SQL file uh, before that. So if all of that works, then you can close this for now, or you can exit and close it. And then after the break, we will look at how you can then expose this database to other applications, connect to it and do things um, with the data that's in the database. Um, all right, uh, so Let's wait for everyone to get to that stage. If you have any questions, then drop them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and ask us. Um, the break will start, I guess, in another 20 minutes. So 2.30 if you're in Eastern time. Um, and then it's a half an hour break. And then we'll be back here at 3 p.m. Eastern and then go through the rest of the hands-on activities uh, at that point. But um, several of us will be here so if you have any questions, we can talk through those. Um, if you have any issues with the deployment so far, uh, please bring that up and we can help you. I was muted. Oh, that, that's great to hear, Mona. Thanks for letting us know. I'm glad it works. Thanks, Saibay. So are there any questions about what you've heard so far or feedback on the Rancher interface or the whole process of um, deploying a, a database. Uh, 
I'm just curious, did you guys develop Rancher? No, Rancher is uh, something that was already existing, uh, but we just use it to manage our, uh, our composable clusters here. Okay, thanks. And there's, there's different versions. So, so this one is um, running 1.6, I think, uh, but there's a newer 2.x version that's uh, got a very different UI, which I personally am not a big fan of, uh, but this is a lot more user-friendly. Um, so Sciway, yes, there is a limit on the storage size and number of CPUs, well, memory and number of CPUs, uh, which is set at your namespace level. Uh, and that's the reason we, we have that limit in there. If you see the instructions, there's a limit for uh, the amount of milli CPUs and maybe bytes that you uh, want to set for this particular application. If you don't set those, it's possible you might run into an error or it might be using default values that are uh, too, too small for your particular application. <coughs> uh, Milson, yes, since this is a composable platform, you can also have GPUs um, uh, and uh, you can, so that can also be part of the composable platform. Anvil right now does not have a GPU in this cluster, but we are um, going to be getting a GPU node. Um, and so uh, we will be adding that to the cluster as well. And in that case, you will be able to uh, request um, a GPU uh, for your particular um, part as well. And Steve, a uh, milli CPU is just one thousandth of uh, uh, CPU core. It's a thousand milli CPUs is just one CPU core essentially. And that that's just the uh, that's just the units that Kubernetes uses, and so that's the reason uh, we do that. And maybe bytes again is Kubernetes specific, so that's powers of two instead of powers of ten uh, in terms of megabytes and gigabytes. Um, Saiwe, yes, uh, uh, you might have missed that portion. So if you want to look at the limits, there's different ways that you can do that. So one way is um, click here, click on the cluster to go to the, to the, oh, wow, we got to a whole other section of Rancher, but we can get to that here as well. Um, so there's a cube control shell here, but I'll show you the easier way to get here. But if you did, Cube control um, describe namespace and your namespace name. Uh, it gives you the quotas that are um, specified. Oh, uh, or quotas okay. that are set for your namespace. Okay, thanks. And you can see here, since I've, I've set um, 2000 milli CPUs, uh, there's a hard limit of 12 CPU cores. Um, since I've used 2,000 milli CPUs, so you can see the amount I've used so far. Um, okay. And also limits on the storage and so on that you can look from there. Okay, thanks. So. There are other questions? So I'll open up the floor here. Uh, for those of you who are gateway developers, um, what are the typical components of the gateway that you usually have to uh, deploy and manage? And feel free to unmute and um, let us know. OK. 
Okay, I might just, uh, I guess, call on folks. So, Milson, do you want to tell us a little about that? Yeah, so we're using, right now we're using a, like an open on demand thing. Okay. Yeah, so people are requesting using those forms. They're requesting more GPU partitions than the CPU. Okay. So those, so then there you're restricted to the applications that open on demand supports and not right. just uh, arbitrary gateways, right? Right, right. Okay, got it. Thanks. No. Okay, does anyone else want to? So Mona, do you want to talk about your gateway experiences and, and the applications you might have to deploy? Um, right now I'm working on a gateway that actually is sits on top of Hub Zero. So we don't have to do much except just to um, work on the application for our specific gateway for the users. So that's kind of nice, but in the past, um, I I have done everything from installing software on a bare machine to uh, setting up databases and so forth. But I think services have come a long way, even right. in the HPC world. So um, yeah, I, I'm not doing as much of that and focusing more on the development for the gateway itself for the specific tools, which is nice. Okay, got it, thanks. Yes, and we will see in the second half, um, there is a specific Jupyter-based gateway um, that's as we, as I said before, based on Voila, that allows you to turn it into app mode essentially. Uh, and uh, I think it it brings a different paradigm where uh, the gateway developer can essentially uh, set up the gateway, but then the researcher can then take over at that point. And if they had to update their code, um, they could just update the container with just their piece of the Python code that's maybe relevant to the science application itself. Uh, and then, um, get that deployed through the Rancher interface. So I think we hope that the, the researchers themselves can have more of a, of a role here, um, uh, especially because many of them might want to have a stricter control over their code or, uh, or want to look at how their code is being deployed. Um, and so for them, uh, it's usually a lot quicker and that, that was part of our whole um, PsyOps, I guess, design or, or die or, uh, um, yeah, um, hope that uh, it further simplifies the, the development aspect of this and reduces the barrier. Uh, Rajesh? Yep. Uh, Steve. Um, yes, Steve. Uh, in that case, uh, how do the developers or the researchers share their their, their containers essentially with other users. Oh, so it, it yeah, and we'll we we'll look at that uh, in the second half. How you ex essentially expose your your okay. application to the to the external world. Uh, yeah, I guess I wasn't too clear on okay. what I said. So I guess if, yeah, if they want to have more control over when they push their code, or they want to maybe uh, change parts of their code and then update it on their own schedule. Um, then they can just uh, maybe up upload their code to GitHub or update it on GitHub. And then we could have a CI CD pipeline that pulls that and then turns it into a container that gets updated and then uh, uh, I guess deployed. Um, oh, okay. Manager. Okay. Yeah, that, that all makes sense. And, and at, as you know, I'm uh, at the center of the tool deployment for Hub Zero platform, right. platforms. And so what you're saying is you're, you're going to automate my job. That's <laughs> well, not you a bad still have thing. To... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the day you 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 make Hub Zero something that can run in Kubernetes, then maybe that day you can hang your hat. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And okay. <laughs> yeah, because we 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 have had pushback from people that say that, like you indicated, that 
they want they do want to work at their own pace and you know sometimes that's three in the morning and you know whatever and so on but anyway so all, all very good thank you but right. yeah thanks okay are there other questions and like i said this is uh, essentially all we have for the first half there's a 30 minute break and starting in 10 minutes so 2 30 eastern uh, and we'd be back here at 3 Eastern, 3 p.m. Eastern for the second half. Um, and we'll continue then. So if you have to take a bio break or grab some coffee or something, then feel free to do that. Uh, we'll be around here uh, monitoring chat if you have questions. Um, and feel free to unmute at any time and ask us questions. Uh, the second half is going to be a little more fast paced. Uh, the instructions as well are probably not as detailed as what you've seen. Um, above uh, but we'll try to show you some more of the the power of the platform and and look at things that we've uh, been talking about on, on exposing your application both to other uh, related applications that are running on rancher and then also the the outside world and um, and how you can automatically scale workloads in response to um, the users who are using it and so on so so that'll give you an idea of how we can accomplish other um, more complex things with the rancher as well. So I hope you are all excited to, to get into that in the second half. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute, uh, but I'll still answer questions. I see another question here. How many people are working on the animal composable substance? So we have a team of, um, I think, three engineers and then a couple of student interns and research assistants as well. Uh, but as I mentioned before, uh, the animal composable subsystem is um, is based on another campus composable system that we have here at Purdue called Geddes. Uh, so we have a lot of experience from the, the previous deployment. And so this is um, essentially uh, pretty similar to that. Um, there's a lot of existing gateways and uh, services that are running on the campus system. Um, Anvil, since it's a pretty new resource, uh, they, we haven't had a whole lot of usage yet, but that's our hope with these activities to, uh, to both the gateways community and others um, to, to see if people would want to host their gateways um, on the Anvil Composable platform and, and the things that it can do to help simplify your, your job of getting these deployed. Um, Ryan's question, if I wanted to expose this running database to a job that's running on the compute portion of Anvil, is that possible or is it only visible to things internal to the pod? Uh, that's a good question. So Ryan, there's different ways of exposing workloads um, in uh, Kubernetes, uh, which is the notion of services. Uh, so, you, so you can either expose it just to other pods running on the same node or just to the Kubernetes cluster itself or to um, the whole world uh, through um, either an IP and a port or even just a, a host name itself. Uh, so there's uh, several layers on the TCP stack that you can expose your application at. Um, and we will look at some of that in the second half. Uh, so, so we look at how this database can be exposed to uh, Jupyter Hub that's running on Anvil Composable. Um, and then we'll also look at exposing the gateway that we're going to be deploying uh, to the external world so you can actually access that from your browser and the different ways that you can configure DNS entries for, for those automatically through Rancher. So yes, I guess the, the short answer is if it's exposed to the, the outside world, then you should be able to um, query it from a node on the compute portion of Apple. Right, since it's three minutes from 2.30, uh, we'll probably take a break now. We will um, do the same thing again in the second half. Um, I'll show um, how we um, do uh, the next set of things on exposing applications, uh, being able to connect to them from other applications. Um, and then we can talk some more. All right, so I hope that was a good teaser of uh, the things that Rancher can do um, and uh, the kinds of applications you can deploy. And we we'll, we we'll look at some more examples now. 
but we will be ramping things up a little now and um, getting through the rest of the hands-on session. So as we said before, the next part is primarily on now interacting with the database we've just deployed uh, through another application and seeing how you can get to access your, uh, your applications from the outside world. Um, so uh, we, we talked a bit about this uh, before the break. Uh, there's different ways um, that Kubernetes allows you to, uh, to network and then expose your applications. Uh, just some basics about networking. So I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with this, but DNS names essentially map these host names or DNS services essentially map host names um, to IP addresses. Um, the applications that we've deployed, they each have a pod IP essentially. Um, and then there's a port in your container that you're exposing for your applications. And so applications typically listen for connections uh, on the socket, which is the combination of the IP address and the port. Um, and again, uh, as you can see here, there's an example of a host name with a port. Um, and this essentially maps to an IP address. So the DNS helps map the, the host name to an IP address. And then the port essentially um, is the port at which the application is listening to. Um, there's different ways that communication occurs in Kubernetes. Uh, between the pods themselves, there's a private cluster network, which is handled by the, um, the container uh, network interface itself. Um, and then there's also network isolation at the project level in, in the Rancher projects that you've seen before. So applications across uh, projects typically cannot um, contact each other or talk to each other via the Kubernetes uh, cluster network. Um, and Kubernetes itself has its own DNS service, which is used when one pod needs to discover another pod, um, given these uh, DNS names. Um, and there's two different kinds of uh, host names that you can get, either internal ones, um, as the first, first example here, and external ones. Um, the second example here, and we will look at uh, ways to um, to create these um, shortly. So um, again, uh, Kubernetes services are ways in which you expose applications on a network. So uh, you have your workload, which is uh, essentially a, a one or more pods. And then the way you expose the, the applications that these pods are hosting um, is through a Kubernetes service. And you can expose these um, on different networks. The, there's the internal network, which is a default where other pods um, subject to the network restrictions can essentially talk to each other through the internal network. Uh, there's the Purdue private network where you can expose these um, applications to only those who are logged in through the Purdue network or the VPN. Uh, and that might be useful if you want to just expose your applications um, to machines in the Purdue network. Uh, maybe you have data ingestion in the lab that's happening that needs to send it over to um, a database, but then you don't want to open it to the wide world. So that, that may be one reason for doing that. Uh, and then there's the public network where you can expose your application to, to anyone um, in the world. Um, and uh, again, services themselves have different types. Uh, we don't need to go through the whole list here. We'll be focusing primarily on load balancer services, uh, which essentially help open this port on a dynamic IP address um, and a host name that you can then map through the DNS as well. And uh, we will see examples of this uh, for the database um, part or workload that we've just deployed and then see how to connect to it. Um, so so uh, there's two different kinds of load balancers. This uh, I mentioned this in response to Ryan's question. So at layer four, uh, typically you have uh, an IP address and a port, um, and then you have these DNS records created automatically. Um, again, these IPs are not static. You might get a different IP if you redeploy the service. Uh, we don't want to get too into the weeds here because these are um, primarily Kubernetes concepts. And since we want to keep this at an introductory level, we will just show how you can do most of these just through the Rancher interface. But, but when you eventually uh, want to deploy your application, then these are some of the, the choices you might have to make depending on your specific use case. And, um, and what the what the needs are for exposing these these different service pieces or, or microservices. Um, so ingress is at layer seven. That's uh, load balancers, which are essentially ingress resources. Um, primarily use HTTP and HTTPS, um, and there you can either use subdomains as the example here. So uh, myapp.namespace, um, or you can also use um, 
Uh, you can expose different workloads to the to multiple ingress resources with the same host name essentially. So in this case, you can see. Um, oh, sorry about that. Um, so um, your host name is the same, but then um, you can use my API for one of your workloads, and then my other API for your other workloads. So, so for example, say you have. Um, uh, a REST API, you might have it at, uh, at one um, subdomain, and then you might have your gateway itself at another one. Uh, but then um, there's, uh, there's some uh, things that you have to, to um, keep in mind, especially if you're translating traffic from these ingress um, provided host names to your pod itself. We won't get into a whole lot of that. Uh, I might just show an example later uh, and there's also documentation. There's a lot of documentation um, in Kubernetes itself on how you specify rewrite rules that essentially make sure that um, your traffic can still be routed to the right location in your pod if you're using these ingress resources. Um, and of course, since you're exposing these to the entire world, uh, it's really important that before you create these services, you make sure that your application is secure. Um, otherwise, anyone would be able to access them. So with that, uh, let's then get into the next stage of the, of the exercise or hands-on activities. Um, this is part three in the document where we will now be creating a service to expose the, the PostGIS or Postgres database um, and then accessing the data in the database from Jupyter to do some calculations on the data that's the database. So going back to our Rancher portal, Let's go back in here to the workload screen. Um, and then there's, if you look here, there's another tab here called service discovery. Uh, that's where we will be going now to now create a new service record for this uh, workload that we've deployed. So go in there, there's one that you will see created by default uh, for the workload. This is just a headless service that doesn't really expose it anywhere outside. Uh, so we'll be creating a new one for us here. So the first step is click on service discovery. Then here at the top right, there's an add record. That is what we will be clicking next. And then very similar to your workload deployment, again, fill in a bunch of options uh, for what we want to do. So let's let's give it a new unique name. Since there's already a service with the name road, so be careful to choose a different one. So I would just say road service in my case, you can choose anything that's different from roads. Um, and then, let the namespace stay as it is, auto-populated. Here we will see, uh, essentially we want the service to now resolve to the workload we've deployed. So let's select that option here that says one or more workloads, click on that. Um, that should change and now let you choose the workload that you want to expose through the service. Click on add target workload, select the roads, um, and then don't hit create yet. Let's look at the advanced options. So show advanced options. Here is where we would select what kind of service we want to create. So uh, under this as a dropdown list, let's choose layer four, which is uh, layer four load balancer. Now again, that gives you a bunch of more options. Um, and here is where we would add the port that we want to expose. So if you recall from the presentation, layer four load balancers essentially um, expose workloads at a host name and a port, and then the host name is mapped by the DNS to an actual IP address. Uh, so we still need to specify the port we are exposing through the service. So add port, click on that. Um, you can give it a name. This can be any name you want, maybe roads port. Um, and this is the actual service port we are publishing. Uh, so for the Postgres database, typically it's the 5432 is the default Postgres port. That's the one we want to uh, expose and publish. So we will use that here. So put that in here. Um, so put in a name for the port, use 5432 as the port, let the protocol stay as TCP, uh, but we need to do some more. Uh, the other part of this is which network pool you're going to be exposing um, the service under. Uh, and so that is typically specified by using an annotation to choose between the Purdue private or public pool. Um, and in our case, we are gonna be choosing the private pool. So 
Once you click on labels and annotations, open that drop down. Uh, click on annotations here to add an annotation. It's a key value pair. So put in the key as the address pool there, and we're using um, a service called Metal LB, which allows us to create load balancers in bare metal um, Kubernetes clusters like what we have here. Um, if you are using commercial cloud like AWS or Google Cloud, then they have their own load balancer, so you wouldn't have to use something like Metal LB. Um, so this is primarily used in bare metal Kubernetes clusters like um, like we have or in other uh, Kubernetes clusters that you might create out of OpenStack. Um, so that's the key, and then the value is annual private pool. So let's put that in as the value. And I think that should be it. So if we hit create, you will see it. It comes up pretty quickly. So services, there's not really a whole lot that happens when you create a service. It's just creating a record uh, behind the scenes. So as long as your uh, pod is running, it should um, come up pretty quickly. And then services stay around even if your pod is deleted uh, because um, when the pod gets started again, uh, the service would just map back to the pod again. So, so you would typically have to delete them by hand even if your pod uh, is deleted. Um, so now that we've created it, uh, let's uh, look at some information on the, on the service. So again, the document tells you to look at this uh, two different ways. We will go back to the, um, the cube control shell. So if you recall, mouse over here on the top left, click on the annual cluster, I think I've got myself into the nodes view, so that's fine. I can always go back there to this. And you can do two different things. You can do cube control dash n, um, and I'll explain this. So, so um, essentially we are doing a get command. So you might recall what we did before for namespaces. So we did cube control get namespace tutorial 01, uh, the beginning of the tutorial. Here we are doing a kube control get um, services, but um, as we said before, um, due to the role-based access control, you have to specify a particular namespace here. And you typically specify a namespace through the dash N option in kube control. So in your case, you would just put in the name of the uh, the namespace there. So kube control get services, but then specific to this namespace. And that lists the two different services we have. This was the default one we saw. Um, and then this is the one that I just created. And you can see there's the name of the, well, not V2. Okay, I'm just gonna expand it a little. Um, so there's the name of the service. There's the type of the service. It's a load balancer layer four. There's two different IPs. This is the internal cluster IP, this is the external IP um, that's mapped to the DNS. And you can see there's the port that we are exposing. Uh, we can now also check to see um, the DNS entry and compare against that. So um, the, the host name that's being used for this service is based on the namespace and the name of the service we chose. So if you did an NS lookup, which is looking up the swan, it would be road service to, 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 to. So um, the, the DNS that's assigned automatically or the host name that's assigned automatically when you create this load balancer service uh, follows the syntax of service name, dot namespace name, um, and then the rest, the suffix is essentially annual cloud.rcac.podio.edu. So in your case, whatever name you used for this load balancer service, dot your tutorial name or your username, which is also the name of your namespace, and then the rest of that. Uh, and if you did an NS lookup, you would see um, the result or the response from the DNS server. Um, and you can see that's the name and that's the IP address it's mapped to, which is essentially the same as the IP address um, in here. So that, that's a quick way of checking to make sure um, that this host name actually maps to that. So um, once you're done with that and you've got the service all defined, I'll just wait for a few minutes. If anyone has any issues, feel free to put it in the chat or unmute and ask us. And then the next step would be to actually 
connect to this database from Jupyter, um, and then do some calculations on the data that's in the database. So Mona, you can, let's see, let's go back to cluster manager. So once you're here um, in the, at the home, mouse over Anvil and then click on Anvil under clusters. And then there should be a launch cube control button here. And then once you click that, it should drop you in the shell. Okay, thanks, got it. And again, just like namespace has shorthand, uh, has the shorthand NS, uh, services is the shorthand SVC. So you could even just do SVC. And then I should get you back to the same thing. Then to go back to your workloads, you would just click on the project that takes you to the screen, which shows you the workloads and the services. And click there to see the options you've selected. And also go back. And if you see here, um, there's the cluster IP that's in gray, but then because this is an external IP as well, you would typically get um, a URL to go to that particular IP and port. But in this case, it doesn't really do anything because it's a uh, Postgres database, but if it, this was a web server and you were exposing it, clicking that would essentially take you to the um, to the application, and we'll see that in the next step once you get into the gateway application. Uh, so I'm going to go on to the next step. So this next step is how it's essentially showing once you have your database deployed um, through Rancher and you've exposed this through a service, it's now exposed through the private pool. Um, now, how do we um, then access the data in the database and to simplify things, we've created a Jupyter Hub deployment that um, is common to all of you. So, any, so all of you can log in essentially to the same Jupyter Hub. Obviously, this is not a production setup. Um, in your particular case, if you were deploying this, you would you would have a database and then maybe a web server uh, that's also deployed as a workload, and you would have code in there to to connect your database. But just for the sake of this tutorial. Uh, we have a Jupyter Hub that's deployed. Uh, you can log in using your tutorial username. So tutorial01. Uh, don't use your password from before. It's just a common password for everyone. It's gateways 2022. Um, so you can, and this is also in the documentation as well. Obviously, since this is a common Jupyter Hub, some of you may have issues spawning the notebook server. Uh, if you have that, just uh, wait a minute and try again. I don't think we have a lot of users here, so hopefully it should open up for all of you. Uh, so if you're familiar with Jupyter Hub, this is essentially um, a kind of gateway or a multi-user Jupyter gateway that allows uh, more than one user to log in. Um, there's different uh, ways of setting up authentication. In this case, obviously, we are using the very simple um, just local username and password, uh, but you can do things like integrate CI logon if you really wanted this to be uh, the basis of your gateway and have people log in with their institutional accounts. <coughs> so Sciway, the, the password is in the Google Doc, but I'll put it in here in the chat. It's gateways 2022. Um, so yeah, so once you've logged into Jupyter, essentially you're running a notebook server and we are going to be running a notebook that connects to this database, pulls in some data and does some calculations. Um, so the first step is to copy this from um, the slash data folder. So there's just a static notebook we have created here um, that you can use for this. Um, so you can just open a terminal here. So if, you, if you're not familiar with Jupyter, once you're here, go to new in the top right, click on terminal, that gives you a shell inside Jupyter, and then you can just run the copy command. And this is just copying this notebook uh, from the data folder into your home directory. 
And once you're done with that, you can exit out of the shell the terminal. And then you should see the notebook show up here in your file list. You can click on that and then just run through these commands. So I would don't run through all of them. So there's a way to run all the cells in the Jupyter notebook. Don't do that yet. Um, you would have to proceed one step at a time. Uh, the main reason for that is because you need to change a few things in this second cell here, uh, which is your password that you chose and also the host name for your database. So if you remember the password you used, um, you can put that in here. If you've forgotten, uh, there's a way to get at it because if you go back to your workloads, you can open a shell into your uh, pod. So just execute a shell and just type env um, and that should get you all the environment variables you've set. And so you can figure that out from there. So there's the Postgres password I've used for that. So that's another way of getting at it. Um, so going back to this notebook, put in the password there, obviously it's plain text, but this is just an example. And then this is the, the host name we want to use. Again, it follows the specification we had before of service name followed by namespace. So in my case, it would be roads service.tutorial01. Um, and again, this is something you can look up like we just did through the cube control shell. So I can confirm, well, actually no, but um, it's pretty straightforward because it's just the name of your service in the namespace. And, and you can um, you can find the name of your service by just going to the, the service discovery tab here. And that's the name. Um, so I'm gonna put that there. The rest of this, you can leave it as is. This is all um, the same for everyone. Uh, let's get through that. And then you can then run through the rest of the steps. Um, typically it's shift enter to run one cell at a time. You can also choose to run it through this run button there. Um, this is just uh, querying the database, finding all the tables um, under this particular schema. And this is something we saw before as well um, when we looked at the, when we got a shell into the database. Um, all it's doing is uh, essentially finding, it's doing very simple computation of which um, city in Michigan has the most um, highway and miles. And this was actually a notebook that was created by undergrad students here at Purdue as part of a data science um, course. And so we are essentially just reusing that notebook here. Um, so you can run through that, validate a few things. Um, so it's just plotting the map. Okay. And doing some computation and then you essentially get um, a sorted list of the county name and the highway length for each county. And um, hopefully everyone's able to reproduce that as well. But, but the key takeaway here is that um, this is essentially another application that's running on the Anvil cloud and then you can connect to it. Um, you can connect to your database from there by essentially just specifying the, um, the, the host name for your database and a few other details um, and access it through that. So I'll wait here again until everyone's gotten through this step. And as always, um, let us know if you have any questions or any issues with this. Yeah, so there's a few things to check. One is the um, make sure the host name for your database is correct. So it's name of your service dot uh, namespace and then the rest. And the other thing would be the, um, the password. And also, I'm sure you've done this Mona, but um, you would have also had to run through those steps of connect, creating the database and populating it. Mm -hmm. I did do that. And we can debug it uh, as well, um, because there's just one other thing after this and it's it's unrelated to this application. So it doesn't depend on having this running. So we can probably um, do that first and then we can go back and I can even log in as, as your user and check to help debug. Uh, so yes, so in the interest of time, moving on again. Uh, so this next one is a little more exciting, I think. Um, and really shows the, the power of Kubernetes and auto scaling. So um, the goal here is to deploy a simple science gateway um, and then um, essentially have Kubernetes scale it automatically 
or scale the number of pods that are running for that automatically based on the, the workload that it's seeing. Um, and so that is what we are going to be doing. So let's just bring up these slides real quick. Um, let's see, yeah, all right. So, so here we use what's called a horizontal pod autoscaler. So um, it's a mechanism to automatically scale the number of pods in your workloads. And this can be based on um, certain metrics that uh, Kubernetes can, can monitor. Those are things like CPU utilization or memory usage. Uh, and so you can provide a threshold and essentially have Kubernetes automatically add more replicas for your pod that's running if your utilization is greater than um, the threshold you provided. And you can also specify a minimum and maximum replica count. So um, as the utilization increases, you would increase the number of replicas, but then only up to the, the maximum. Um, and since this is based on a, an actual resource metric that's being monitored, uh, so as the utilization or memory goes down, um, then Kubernetes or, or the autoscaler would automatically scale down the number of um, the replicas uh, if there isn't um, um, that level of load again. Um, and so uh, we'll get back to this, but let's look at the autoscaler in action. So again, here um, we are going to be deploying a new workload. This is the one I've mentioned a few times before. This is the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, workload that's been turned into app more through Walla. Um, this was actually a gateway that one of our um, developers built for a faculty here at Purdue in um, agriculture and biological engineering. So uh, there's a lot of uh, gene co-expression data that they have for several plants. And this um, gateway is used to essentially make it easier to, to query that data, uh, but then also visualize it in different ways. And in this particular case, um, just following up on the discussion we had before with Steve, um, the faculty and their postdoc wrote most of the code in Python. They just wanted to have a web interface in front of it, but then they also wanted to be able to um, change it whenever they could, um, if they had new visualizations to add um, and other data to bring in. So as before, we are gonna be creating a new workload. This time it's a different um, container image. So we are gonna be using that and you can see it's uh, highlighted here in yellow. Um, the options are a little simpler this time. We won't be having a persistent volume. So, so go back to your project, go to workloads, click deploy as before. Uh, you can give it a name. It's gonna use Coexp because it's called the Coexplorer. In the Docker image, you can put in the, um, the registry uh, image name for the gateway we are deploying. Um, make sure the namespace is auto-selected. And then uh, we are not doing persistent storage, but since we are going to be doing a pod auto-scaler, so we are going to set the memory and CPU limits again, as before. So um, if you remember from before, um, after you filled out all of these in the first section here, go all the way down to show advanced options, click on that. Um, open up the security and host config section drop down, and then go down here to memory and CPU reservation. This time we are going to be adding both a reservation and a limit. Um, and again, these um, come from Kubernetes, but essentially the idea is that the reservation uh, makes sure that the node to which this pod is being deployed actually has those resources available. So it would only choose a node that has um, free resources um, for the amount of reservation you're seeking. Uh, and the limit essentially makes sure that your pod doesn't go beyond that particular limit. And so we are essentially just um, showing you how to put in both of those options here. I mean, they're not really very um, germane to this particular, well, some of it is germane to this example, but it's essentially just showing you that you can have both of those and then it's also going to be used um, by the autoscaler in determining when to scale up the replicas. So let's uh, make sure we put in the right limits. So you can see here, the CPU has to be 1000 milli CPUs and the memory is 4000 milli bytes. So uh, put that in, in both the reservation and the limit. So enter the value here, and then also select limit and enter it there. Similarly for CPU, put in a value there, 
switch the radio button to limit, put that there, and then hit launch. Uh, as before, you can see it came up pretty quickly. Um, so it's active and running. Now we are going to be exposing it um, um, to the to the world so that we can actually access this gateway. So you can see again, as before, um, we are going to be creating a layer four load balancer for a particular port, but this time we are going to be using um, the public pool so that you can access it from your browser and it's not just accessible through the Purdue VPN or internal to other pods. So go back to service discovery, add a record. Let's call this Coexplorer service to so make sure you choose a different name because Coex is already used by the default headless service. Um, again, choose the right tutorial or namespace or make sure it's auto populated. Click on one or more workloads, choose your co-explorer workload, um, and then show advanced options, which is where we will be providing the rest of the arguments. So, um, make sure again to choose layer four load balancer, and then add port. And we will make sure to choose the right port that's being exposed by the container. So in this case, it's 8866, which is a non-standard port that's being used instead of the default Jupyter port of 8888. So make sure you put in the right port number, um, put in a name for that. And then again, the way we choose the network to expose this on is through annotations. So go into the annotation section, put in the, the key, which is the address pool to use. And then the value is the animal public pool. And that is all that's needed. And then just hit create. It should come up pretty quickly as you can see. Um, and just as before, you can click through, expose, look at the service. Uh, if you mouse over this, you can see it shows you the IP and the, the port number, but then we also know what the host name is. It's just the same as before. Um, so we can get to that um, directly. And so if you open a new tab on your browser, and we went to Yeah, I, I don't know why I did HTTPS. So yeah, I wouldn't do HTTPS. I would just do put in um, service name dot namespace dot annual cloud or rcsc dot and then the port number 8866 and that should get you to the gateway. Um, and so this is the gateway here uh, that's been developed for this. As you can see, it has different tabs. Um, it allows you to filter for different genes and then look at a lot of different um, data about it. So let's just try to use it as a typical researcher would do. So put in the gene ID there, go to the bottom and hit apply filter. That gets you the data. Um, and then you can look at different visualizations for it. So if you went to um, plot by co-expression and all of this is in the document here, and so you can follow along. Um, so this allows you to choose a bunch of options, click on that, it gives you a network graph, as you can see. And then you can also get the differential expression for it. Um, so that's um, some cool visualizations for the, for the co-expression data for these genes for maze. Um, so, so this is a typical user using this gateway. Uh, but now we want to see the autoscaler in action. Um, and so if you're, as you can see, obviously we were careful enough to limit this to a particular single gene ID, but then if you had, if you left this blank and then try to just hit apply filter, then it's going to be assembling all of this data, which is quite a lot of data. Um, and so it's going to use up a lot of your resources and that's why uh, if you had multiple users now trying to use this gateway, it would get bogged down. So that's where the 
the autoscaler comes into play. So let's go back and add that. So again, going back to this um, page here, there's, uh, there's several things here at the top that you can see. So if you go under resources, there's other different resources that you can deploy. One of those is HPA, which is the horizontal pod autoscaler. So if you clicked on that, uh, it brings you to this page here. And again, as all other pages, it's always the top right where you add a new resource, so add HPA. Um, and again, filling in different options. So let's just call this that. Uh, namespace is filled automatically, select a workload. Um, here is where you would choose the number of replicas you want. So the minimum is one. Let's just choose a max of three replicas just for the sake of demonstrating here. And here is where you would choose the, the thresholds and the metrics that need to be monitored. So, um, and obviously there's different types of metrics that you can monitor. Um, so there's some which uh, need more uh, services to be integrated, but let's just use resource for now and CPU. Um, so there's different um, statistics that you can use. In this case, we're just using utilization and using 10%. So if it's 10% uh, of the CPU um, limit then or reservation, then it's going to create a new replica for you. So um, just hit create, and then you can wait for it to get initialized. And then we'll see this in action pretty soon. So, all right, is um, that running? Uh, as you can see here, it uh, also shows you the number of replicas you have. There's only one replica currently, and you have one to three. Uh, and it's also got the information on the um, on the metrics that need to be monitored. So um, now let's try to create some load for this gateway. So we will essentially just open a new browser window, um, do the same thing there, launch this gateway, and um, just try to get all the data without filtering. And this takes a while to load up sometimes because um, the gateway is designed to read some data and, pre and construct the UI um, dynamically. So let's just go down to the bottom, apply the filter. Um, I can go back to my, my Chrome window, do the same thing there. So this is just simulating different users accessing the gateway. And if we go back here, you can see it's already scaled up to two replicas uh, just because of the load so far. And um, the load balancer makes sure to automatically route it to any one of those pods as you um, put in that um, host name of the, of the service. And if you go back actually to your workloads tab here, you can see um, for this particular uh, workload, the Coex workload, there's actually two pods that are running um, and you can get into any one of those pods if you want to open a shell in them. And then again, this is the other instance that we've launched. We can go down here again and hit apply filter again. And then it's going to scale up to, if we go back to the HPA tab, it's going to scale up to three pretty soon. What happens when you hit the max and there's additional requests? Um, so yeah, so, th so that's part of our, if you remember the PSYOP cycle, uh, that's where the user, uh, the researcher gets into the picture. So if they notice a lot of load uh, and the replicas are not sufficient, then they can choose to just come in here and update the HPA to add, to increase the number of replicas. Um, so that, that, that's essentially what you would do. So you would just look at the data. Uh, if you see the replicas are not sufficient, or if you hear that you, users are not um, getting very good uh, performance, then you would just scale up. Um, I think there's ways to also monitor the metrics. So you can, there's, there's, in, there's Prometheus integrations and other things you can do so that you can also get dashboards of the, of the utilization. And then that could also help you preempt those issues and um, increase the number of replicas, the max replicas. But of course, I mean, beyond a certain point, if you've, um, I mean, obviously you can scale it 
to whatever um, level you need. Um, and then once you hit the resource limits of the cluster itself, then that's a different question. But um, <coughs> yeah, so essentially, I guess the short answer is you can you can update your HPA to to increase the number of replicas if needed. Well, from the user um, perspective, what do they see? Does the whole thing tip over, or just that you sit there and wait a long time? Yeah, you would just wait a long time because um, as you um, so the service, so this and since this is a load balancer service. Uh, the host name is going to be the same for everyone, but behind the scenes, Kubernetes is essentially routing it to one of the pods uh, because all of them map to the same service. Um, and so depending on whichever pod um, has more load, um, if it has more load, then it's just going to be very slow. And I mean, so it's always going to get you to a pod, uh, but then depending on the load on that pod, um, it's just going to be very unresponsive at that point. Okay, thanks. And that also depends on how your application is designed. Um, so if you if you can make use of threads and other things, then that's a different story. But yes. Um, so it's it's taking at two. So I guess since we are not really doing a whole lot and it's already returned the results, so um, but you might notice a different perform or notice different behavior. So we are just gonna close all those out, and then you will see it drop down to one again pretty soon. So let's just say I closed all this down. And since the minimum is one, so it's always going to have one replica running, uh, but you'll see this drop down to one pretty soon. So that essentially brings us to the end of the um, the, the hands-on activities itself. So I'm going to wait here a bit so everyone can try this out, see that everyone's got the gateway running. Uh, there's a few other things I wanted to show, but uh, we'll just wait for maybe um, five minutes or so. And then I'll show you Ingress, uh, which allows you to get uh, custom host names, uh, of course, in the same domain, but which, uh, which are easier to remember than having to put in a port number. And we can also look at the app catalog, which allows you to deploy more complex applications in Rancher. But if anyone has any issues, then feel free to ping us again and let us know how you're gateway and HPA deployment is going. So were you able to resolve the, the database issue, Mona? Uh, not yet, I was just went back to look at it. Okay, I can try logging in, maybe a user, let's see. Okay. Okay, so this RC K. So that's the name of the service. And let's just make sure the password environment variable is set. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I like see the error. It's SRC. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, works. That's an impressive eagle eye. <laughs> Service, yeah. yeah, source, yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, let's go back here. All right, so was everyone able to get the, the gateway and HPA running? And as you can see, it's dropped down to one replica again, since we haven't really done anything on the gateway.
Let me give it a couple of more minutes and then I can show you ingress and um, and shots. All right, um, so uh, as you saw here, when we were trying to access the gateway, it was, it was pretty cumbersome. You had to use the, um, the service name and the, um, the, the, the namespace and also the port number. Um, so that, that's great for internal access to those services, but when you want to expose it to the outside world uh, or make something um, a memorable name, then it's usually useful to um, leverage ingress resources at that point, which is again, a different kind of load balancer, but at layer seven, the TCP stack. So uh, again, going back to our load balancing um, tab here. So we haven't really seen this so far, but we've been working in workloads and service discovery, uh, but there's a load balancing here in between. You can see there's two load balancers that we already have, which were the layer four load balancers, but now we can add ingress, which is layer seven. So if you click on add ingress, um, can we are going to be doing this for the co-explorer gateway because that's what we want to access through there. So there's different ways that you can get a host name for um, ingress services. Uh, if you want to use one that's in the Anvil cloud domain, which is what I'm going to be showing now. So you can provide the host name that you want to use. So click on this particular radio button, specify host name to use. And then let's call this um, coex. So you do have to put in the whole name there. So I'm just using coex. That. Um, and then uh, you need to essentially map it to the word. So just like before, this is a little different than the service screen. Uh, but you are essentially um, creating the ingress resource, specifying the host name you want to use, and then choosing the workload you're mapping it to. Uh, so you choose the workload here and this list here, put in the port that you want to use. This path, like I mentioned before, um, you can use it if you want to have multiple ingress rules for your gateway. So if you wanted to add maybe another rule, um, you would add that in there, but otherwise, don't really need to do that. Uh, if you wanted to have multiple uh, microservices accessible at different paths in your domain, that's where you would do that. In our case, we're just exposing one, so we don't really need to do that. It would just be at the, um, the domain itself. So um, that's the other thing. Then let's see. I don't think there's anything else that needs to happen. I think we would just hit that and see if it works. Uh, and again, it shows up under your list of load balancers. And since here it's creating, uh, and all of these, I mean, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you might be familiar with having to create these through YAML, uh, where you would have sections for the host name and for HTTP and HTTPS, and then the service you're mapping it to and all of that, but here it's a lot simpler. Uh, so this one's active now, um, and it's going to be using the SSL certs for the Anvil Cloud domain, since, since this is just a subdomain there. Uh, so you should be able to do that, and then the gateway comes up again as before. So, so it's the same workload, the same pod, you just have multiple services that um, essentially point to it. So in this case, we are using a layer seven ingress service um, or ingress resource or ingress load balancer, I guess, to be accurate. Um, and so now you don't have to put in your service name dot, dot namespace and the port at the end, or you can just use this 
much more easier name um, and expose it through that. But behind the scenes, it's all just the same pod. Um, so your previous thing still works. Uh, it's all pointing to the same workload, but they are just load balancers that redirect traffic to your, um, your pod, essentially. Um, so that's, that's one thing I wanted to show. Uh, the other thing I want to show is the app catalog. Um, and this is not exposed to the tutorial users, but I can log in through my regular user and just show you what, um, if you did end up having an access allocation to Anvil, this is how you would log into that. So go to the same URL, but then here, instead of using a local user, we are logging with Shibboleth. Um, and here you can use your access username. And I'll talk about allocations in a bit uh, here. Um, so you use your access username and password. Um, let's do the two factor. So, right. And it should get you to the same familiar UI as before, but it's a little different now. So you, as you can see now, there's different access allocations that show up as projects here. So if you did have an allocation on Anvil and got access to the composable portion, you would see your um, access allocation show up here. So you could click on that. And then these are the different applications I have running there. Uh, but what I wanted to show was this apps section here, uh, which allows you to launch more complex applications. So, so far we have been launching really simple single container workloads. We did a Postgres database, we did the co-explorer gateway, which was just a Jupyter um, container. But in, in Kubernetes, there's the notion of um, Helm charts, which are essentially, uh, I guess, packages of different applications that can be linked together. Um, so you can have multiple um, containers running. You can also have your Helm chart create the, the volumes that you need. So, so it's all specified on the YAML syntax. Um, and you can have dependencies among Helm charts. So for example, say you wanted to launch a uh, your complete gateway that had a message queue, um, it has maybe a database, it has a web server, then you could make your, um, your message queue and database uh, dependencies for your web server, um, have the dependencies launched first and then uh, do a lot of complex um, interactions with your, with your different pods. Uh, that's uh, obviously not in the scope for today, but uh, it's just a quick idea of uh, the kinds of complex applications you can deploy. Uh, but um, under apps, there's already a catalog of different Helm charts and repositories that we have right now. Obviously, there's a few errors here, so you can ignore that. Um, and you can add your own catalog if you want uh, from GitHub or other sources. But if you went to launch, then you can see uh, these are all the apps that are already available here um, through the catalog that we have. So you can see this, there's quite a few, comp there's obviously Jupyter Hub, which is available through a Helm chart. Uh, there's a few other applications like Timescale DB, uh, which can be launched on multiple nodes with different replicas. So this is a Postgres database with, um, that also supports time series data. Um, there's a few other popular applications here. Um, there's an Elk stack. Um, there's um, Grafana. There's this other things. There's Kafka. Um, so uh, the different publicly available Helm charts um, are all available here as well. So if you wanted to launch a really complex application stack uh, with multiple components, then you could do that. You can obviously also create your own Helm chart. So you, for example, you have MySQL or MongoDB um, and you can create your own Helm charts as well. Um, the way you would parameterize any of these is through um, what Helm calls values or val the value YAML file. And uh, most of those options are typically also available to you um, in uh, when you start configuring or deploying one of these applications. So, um, so you would have the different Helm options. You can edit the YAML file as well. Um, you can put in a bunch of other values. It would show you um, the, the template for the values YAML, which is used in Helm to uh, modify options or change configurations. So here you can see, um, this is essentially the values that's pulled in from the, the repository for timescale DB. And you can see there's, there's the number of replicas. Um, there's the, um, the actual container images that are being used, um, the different secrets for the passwords that you can configure, 
um, and really a lot of other things. Um, and so um, obviously you can either, if you're a power user, you can edit this YAML file and upload it and use that. Or you can um, look up one of the values in here that you want to maybe mod modify. For example, maybe you wanted to change the replica count. Um, then you can add those as variable values here. And these would override essentially the, the settings in the, in the YAML file. Uh, so obviously I don't want to get too, too far into weeds here, but the main idea is that uh, while you can launch simple applications, there's a lot more complex applications you can launch. Um, and especially if you were doing a gateway that had multiple microservices, you could create a single Helm chart um, for that with all the different services. Uh, and then essentially launch it with with one button if you if you've developed that for your gateway. And obviously, um, as before, you can modify any of the values in your Helm chart. So say you wanted to change the number of replicas or you wanted to update the container image for one portion of your chart for one of the workloads, you can just update the value um, here and then Kubernetes would automatically um, shut down those uh, pods that are affected by that change and then bring back, bring up the new versions of those pods if needed. So, so you can manage um, essentially uh, continuous deployment pretty easily with that. Um, all right, so we've got close to half an hour left. I just want to do a couple of wrap up slides and then I can take uh, more questions or have more discussions again towards the end. So let me just run through these really quickly. So uh, I mentioned allocations on Anvil. So uh, so it's all allocated through access. Um, so if a researcher or a gateway developer needs access, you can request it through the, um, the access allocations form. Uh, there's different kinds of resources that are allocated on Anvil. Uh, there's the CPU cluster itself, but then there's also the GPU subsystem that's allocated separately. Uh, the composable right now, we are still working through the um, the charge rates for the different composable resources. So it's not something that you can request through access, but as long as you have an allocation on either the CPU or the GPU portion, you can always request composable as an add-on to that. Um, and then we'll just work with you to, uh, to get you access to the composable portion uh, based on the, um, the workloads or the gateway that you plan to run on there. Um, for the CPU system itself, there's on GPU, there's different kinds of job queues, probably not too relevant um, to this discussion, uh, but due to the, uh, the large size of the cluster, there's, there's quite a few, or, and the large core count as well, there's, there's quite a few large jobs that you can um, run on the animal cluster itself. Uh, so with that, I wanna thank all of you for, for attending and joining us in this tutorial. I hope it was useful and interesting. Um, there's some links and email addresses in here. So if you have any questions or want to discuss a gateway workload with us, you can send it to anvil at purdue.edu.